If you've ever wanted to build a chessboard or have an interest in seeing how one is made, well then you're in the right place. Hey, it's Connor here, and in this video I'll be handcrafting a chessboard from Purple Heart, Padauk, and Maple. The first crucial step in this process is to mill all the lumber to a flat, uniform thickness. I'll be using my miter saw to rough cut the length of the boards. This will make it much easier for me to flatten the boards later on. I'll be repeating the following steps on the Purple Heart and Maple boards as well, but for efficiency I'll simply explain the milling steps by following the padauk. All the boards are far too wide to face joint, so I edge jointed them first so that I could take them over to the table saw and rip them all out to a smaller width. Once all the boards were ripped to fit the capacity of my jointer, I then face jointed all the boards to flatten one side. The milling process is crucial to make a great chess board, as the symmetry and uniformness of the checkered pattern is what makes a chess board look so appealing. Next, I need to run all the boards through the thickness planer until I have every board of the same thickness. These boards needed to all be planed down to just under 3 fourths to achieve a uniform thickness free from all blemishes. Now all that's left to do is to edge joint each board so they're ready to be cut out to the final width on the table saw. There are a total of 64 squares on a chessboard. 32 of them will be made from the padauk wood and the other 32 will be made from the maple wood. You want to figure out how big your chess pieces will be first in order to figure out how wide to make your squares. For this chessboard, I want the squares to be two and a quarter, so I'm ripping the boards out to that width. To make sure the boards have enough length, I times two and a quarter by eight to get 18, then I'll add three to that number to end up with a rough length of 21 inches. You'll need four boards of each type of wood that are milled to the proper width and have the proper length. As explained, you'll simply times the width of the square by eight and then add three inches, and that will leave you with plenty of length. Once these boards have been milled, I'll arrange them in an alternating pattern, making sure to face the best side up. Once the arrangement is set, I'll use my parallel clamps to glue these boards together. I'll be repeating the gluing process again later in case you wanted to see my setup. After the initial eight boards are glued together, you'll need to square up one end. Since this chessboard is so large, I have no way of cross-cutting the end. So instead, I clamp a large steel square ruler to the end of the board. I place super glue along the edge of one side and glue a straight board referencing the square. The trick here is to make sure the board you glue hangs over the edge. With the new reference board against the table saw fence, I can now get a perfect 90 degree cut on the other side. Squaring up one end is critical for the next step of the project as we'll be referencing this edge. After this cut is complete, we will rotate the board so that our new squared up end is against the fence instead. Now we will cut the board into eight sections at the exact same width as we ripped the eight boards out originally. This will make each of the squares on this chessboard exactly two and a quarter by two and a quarter. This board was far too big for me to use a miter gauge or a table saw sled. However, if you're making a smaller chessboard that could be cross cut using these jigs, then this will be an ideal time to utilize them. However, I found that by ripping these boards after squaring one of the ends to be a highly accurate and repeatable process. I have a fine finished 60 tooth blade installed on my table saw, which is great for these types of cuts. A table saw blade with fewer teeth will have a greater chance of leaving the edge not as smooth and has the possibility of tearing out the wood. If your math was correct, your eighth cut should be just shy of the end of the board. Leaving yourself with extra length is always a good idea, but we certainly don't want to waste lumber that can be used on another project. As I cut these strips out on the table saw, I made sure to stack them in order so I can lay them back down in their original form. I took careful consideration as to how these boards would be arranged in the beginning and I want to make sure I maintain that form. To make the chessboard really come to life, we simply need to rotate every other board to create the checkered pattern. At this stage, you can see why wood selection in the beginning is so important. In my opinion, it's best to use lumber that has a uniform color without much variation. That way, when the boards are cut up and then spread out into 64 different squares, the look stays consistent over the entire length. I also highly recommend numbering the boards at this point so you don't mix up the order. Next, the eight strips will need to be glued together in the order in which we laid out and numbered in the previous step. There are two big mistakes you can make at this step of the project. One of those mistakes is accidentally clamping the boards together with far too much pressure and cause them to bow as the glue dries, leaving you with a chessboard that's not flat at all. The second mistake you can make is by not aligning the boards up properly to make a perfect grid. To solve that problem, I recommend clamping reference boards to either side to sandwich all eight strips together, which takes the guesswork out of aligning the grid pattern. After these boards are glued together, I'll go ahead and sand the intended bottom with 40 grit sandpaper to smooth the surface and to remove any dry glue. 
Although the basic shape of the chessboard is complete, there are many finishing touches left that are important to take an ordinary piece and turn it into something stunning. One of those finishing touches that I find important is to glue the chessboard to a flat substrate. I'll be using this MDF panel as a substrate. This will not only add weight and strength to the chessboard, but will also keep everything flat. You'll notice I didn't bring the MDF panel to the edge, and this is because I wanted to create a floating effect for the chessboard. However, taking the bottom panel to the edges, trimming it flush, and then creating a border is something that has also worked well for me. I used my Bessie F-Style clamps to glue the MDF panel securely to the chessboard. If your chessboard at this stage isn't perfectly flat, it's not a problem because this step will correct any small imperfections in the chessboard's flatness. Now it's time to break out the purple heart that I milled up earlier. I'll be using it to create a border around the chessboard. I created many test pieces of various widths until I landed on one that seemed to match the best, and then I wrote the purple heart boards to that final width. I also wanted to create a beveled edge to the purple heart border, and decided that cutting these bevels out on the table saw to be the easiest way to create that look. You could also create a decorative edge by using a specialized router bit as well. I would recommend testing out various looks by creating test pieces with different species of wood until you land on something that looks aesthetically pleasing. To finish this border, we have to measure and cut 45 degree miters in each of the corners. After measuring and marking these boards with precision, we can take them over to the miter saw to complete the cuts. Oftentimes, when a cut is so crucial like this one, I will trim the board just shy of the mark and then test fit the board and see how it fits before cutting up to the line, and I have found that it saves me a lot of mistakes. After all the miters have been cut, I can glue the border onto the chest board using a band clamp. If you create a border, you may notice some hairline gaps between the edge of the chest board and the border. These gaps will easily be closed up by the glue if you make sure to apply a generous amount. Any leftover gaps on the chessboard will be later filled with wood putty. Once the purple heart border was glued on, I flipped the chessboard over to glue on the padauk border to cover up the MDF. Although you can't really see any of the MDF from the top view, I think it looks way nicer to finish out the bottom with a border. You could take this one step further and also add on a 8th inch oak panel or something similar to cover up the MDF entirely for the best finished look possible. The key to a great finish and to maintain a flat top surface is to sand patiently and let the sandpaper do the work as you glide it across the surface from top to bottom. This is a tedious process, but highly worth it. Once I've sanded from 40 grit to 320 grit, I will place painter's tape on the outside of wherever any small gaps are, even if they're barely noticeable. The painter's tape prevents the wood filler from seeping into the surrounding wood fibers and makes it to where there's no extra dried filler to sand afterwards. I didn't have wood filler to match the exact color of the purple heart, but I noticed that the walnut wood filler I had on hand matched close enough to do the trick. Now before the wood filler completely dries, I'll carefully remove the painter's tape, leaving behind only the wood filler that filled the hairline cracks. Once the wood filler has dried, I will begin sanding from where I left off, which was at 320 grit. And for this project, I'll work my way all the way up in increments up to 2000 grit for the top surface and the border. The bottom portion was sanded to 320 grit, and I'll just leave it at that. To finish this chessboard, I'm using Odie's Oil, which is a natural hard wax. Odie's Oil has become one of my favorite finishes, and it's easy to apply and the appearance is top notch compared to some of my other finishes that I've used in the past. To apply Odie's Oil natural hard wax, you use a non-woven pad, which helps the wax work into the wood fibers. I applied a generous amount over the surfaces of the entire chessboard, including the bottom. While some finishes don't really do much in terms of popping out the color, Odie's Oil has a tendency to not only pop the colors of the wood, but sometimes can enhance them. Once the wax has been thoroughly worked into the wood fibers, it's best to let the wax saturate the wood for 20 minutes. After that time, the wax needs to be buffed with a cotton terry towel, preferably white, so you can visually check when all the wax has been buffed off. The very last thing I did before calling this chessboard complete was adding four rubber feet to the bottom so it doesn't move at all while playing. The chess pieces were the very first thing I decided on before the project even began. They are huge and nearly fill the entire two and a quarter inch square. The pieces are made of metal and also weighted to give you the best playing experience possible. I think the floating design also makes a chessboard pop, which is really cool. I think the overall key to making a great chessboard is to be diligent about your design and the material selection. Thanks for watching, and I hope you really enjoyed this video and maybe learned something along the way.